on the head of a common pin is the basis of your life. It is considered nothing and it is cast into darkness. And when it contacts the egg, it forms a tiny drop of blood and that blood begins to rotate in the darkness of the womb even as the planets rotate. And it is this movement of that tiny drop of blood in the darkness of the womb that begins the process of breaking down and building up that forms this matter called congealed blood, which is the clot. Yeah. Now that's you, that's me forming from something that is infinitesimally small and disgusting out of its proper environment. Here you are now a lump of congealed blood. Then you form into a lump of flesh called embryo. Then you evolve to a fetus. Then you evolve in that fetus-like state until you are prepared to come forth out of that tiny house. And when you come forth out of that house, you are formed complete yet incomplete. You are complete in your make but you know nothing. The Quran says every child is born into the world knowing nothing. So the child that comes into the world from the formation in the darkness of the womb must now become a creature that is apart from the beast of the field. And the only thing that separates the human family from the beast of the field is that we have the ability to learn, to grow in knowledge, and to master the things of creation around us. Do you hear what I'm saying, beloved? So if you do not set your heart for knowledge, if your mother does not place you in an environment to learn, then your growth becomes stagnated. Look at what a baby learns in the first year of its development without a teacher. In the first year, it learns to crawl and walk and pull up and begin to recognize objects and try to get to you know to move its hands to get control of that object in the first year without a teacher that baby is learning it is growing we have an obligation we have a duty we have a responsibility to put that new life in an environment that will keep feeding the mind you see so that the child grows and gains control of the fire of its own being. You are some of you now have noticed your daughters at eight and nine developing breasts. Some little girls are having their menses at nine years old. Some little boys at nine and 10 are developing the sperm so that these two under any circumstance that is not guarded can come together and that nine-year-old girl can be made pregnant because she doesn't understand what she's come into. <clears throat> the feeding of hormones into the food, into the meats that the children are eating is causing them to grow like the cattle grow, like the pigs grow, like the chicken grow. They're fattening them to get to market quick to make a profit. Your children are getting fatter to go to life quicker than their minds are able to perceive what the body is doing, man. Can't you see what the hell is going on? Don't you realize you're being destroyed on a daily basis because you have no control? Control is being taken from you by the masterminds. And because I dare to speak what I see and what I know is a fact, no one can take this from me. You want to call me everything but what I am? Here's a nine-year-old with menses and breasts forming up. Here's a man, a grown man, maybe the father. He's being bombarded every day with sex. Baby, let's get into it. Baby, let's do it. 
Baby, you feel so good to me. Baby, let's work it out all night long. In the heat of the night and back into the heat of the day. Come on, baby, let's do it. This is the crap that you're being fed on a daily basis and you can't handle it. You ain't got enough up top to handle what's going on, brother. They making a damn freak out of you and you don't even see what's going on. They feeding you food, listen to me. They're feeding you food that make you susceptible to suggestion. Drugs in the food, drugs in the water, making you susceptible to wicked suggestion. So they put on the tapes and on the records. If you play them backward, you hear little subtle messages coming out. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I love Satan. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Coke is good. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. They ain't talking about that Coke that is <laughs> uh, Coca-Cola. But when they say Coke is it, Coke is it. Coke is it. I mean, and they lay it on you with a rhythm. Coke is it, do, 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 do. and you patting your foot. Coke is it, stop it. Coke is it, and that's a suggestion. Coke is it, rock. Coke is it. This nice rhythm just laid in your brain. Then before you know it, somebody say, hey man, I got some coke. Back in the subliminal chambers, or the subconscious chambers, the subliminal suggestion say, coke is it. What is that perfume you got on, sister? Opium. My wife brought the damn thing home. I said, what is that you got there, girl? She said, honey, it's opium. I said, I don't want it in my house. It suggests something. The children looking at their mama. What's that you got on, mommy? Smells so sweet, darling. It's opium. Smell it, honey. Does it smell nice? Oh, mommy, can I have some? Oh, sure, baby. They're conditioning your minds for opium down the road. But you can't see this. You don't know this enemy. So when somebody knows him and points him out to you, you say he's a hate teacher. He cutting your hair off in a V shape down in the back of your neck. See, it looked like the hair of the crotch, but you can't see that. So when you walk with your hair cut off, in a V shape. Any man that looks and walks behind you, he's getting the idea of a crotch. You men with these damn little things hanging off the back of your head. You don't know what you do. cheek and as you move and you know you ain't got no foundation on so you just move <laughs> and the buttons are just jumping any man walking behind you he sees motion and it attracts his attention his mind is right on your buttons and you know what I'm talking about how in the hell can we build anything decent when you are being bombarded with filth and you sisters love the damn thing because it makes you think you are something now because a man is looking at your backside. Hell no, you ain't nothing when a man is looking at your backside. Why the hell you want to attract a man to your backside when you can attract him to your mind? Excuse me for talking like this. We can explore that in a short amount of time. And after we explore that and find out that it ain't but so many feet wide or short or long, then a man moves on to another backside. How the hell can you keep your husband like that? But you let the white man make a piece of meat out of you. That's why there's no control. Because you want him out of control so that you can control him. That's a hell of a thing. Woman want to control a man. You can't control him with that. And if you do, how in the hell can you love him? You can't love no man that you control with your body, sister. 
Once you got a man that you control with your body and you use your body to tell him come today and go tomorrow, be here tomorrow night, same time, same thing, and bring the money with you. Then the man that you ultimately end up with is a man that whooped the hell out of you. Call you one of them female dogs and smack you down. That's the kind of man you end up loving. Because any good man that you get, you want to make him a dog. Where there are no decent women, there are no decent men. And there ain't hardly a damn decent woman nowhere to be found in the wilderness of North America. Now, am I wrong? No, sir. Sister, I don't talk like this because I don't like you. I love you. But I'm hurt all down inside because I see a nine-year-old girl with breasts and a nine-year-old girl with menses. And I see men drooling because they can't control the older woman. A man's 30. He can't marry no woman near his age. Because he can't handle her. He got to go find him something that just come out of school. Or trying to go to school. He got to get something that don't know nothing so he can teach her. And after he start teaching her in a few days, she get tired of him. It's a sad, sick thing. That fathers now are going with their little girls. Can't wait for the mother to leave the house before the father called a little daughter in the room. Say, this is a secret between me and you, baby. Don't tell your mom. You don't know, brothers, but if you were to ask black women how many of them have been messed over by their fathers, by their uncles, by their brothers, you'd be surprised. A woman can't even think a decent thought about a man because all the men she ever met were dogs. Gonna call me an anti Semite because I point out that the Jews that control Hollywood, Go ahead, brother. I don't control no Hollywood, brother. Go ahead. The Jews tell you quick that's theirs. Who making these movies? You can't even go to a movie, take your children to a movie. It's a MF this, a son of a B that, F you this, mother this. Your children sitting there with you. Right. Explicit sex on the screen. Right. Years ago when they had a scene, you would see two people embrace, kiss, then you get nature scenes so you can try and understand what was going on with the sun getting dark and the moon coming up. Water running. Not today. No water hell. No moon nothing. They show them undressed. Naked. Huh? Bold display of sex. How in the hell can a little child sitting there see people moaning and groaning under something that seems so nice? Well, I need to experience that myself if it's that good. How can a child 10 years old control its sexuality when grown men and women 40 and 50 are losing control. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. All your passions are eating you up. You like a people on fire, burning up in heat. Our women are like heat in heat, man. And they burning up like ovens. The brothers is in like dogs in heat, man. They, 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 they wild, They're crazy. I mean, I'm not trying to be smart, brother. But you're being controlled, man. And as long as you got your mind on a behind, how you gonna think for your success, for your independence, for your liberation? You know he got you. He puts them movies out. This ain't just affecting you. It's affecting all of America. 
Who makes the alcohol? Who are the big alcohol merchants? Come on! Who's Mr. Bronfman? Shitless. You the drunkards. You the drunkards. You like the best liquor. Alcohol is killing the American people. It's killing you on the highways. It's killing you in your homes. But every week you buy it. And the merchant that's producing it is getting rich. The cigarette is killing you in your lungs. Now they got a fight going on. Because Elijah Muhammad taught us over 40 years ago. He didn't want none of his followers smoking. And we put it down. And people said we were crazy over 50 years ago. And now you begin to see that Elijah Muhammad was right on it because the Arab world, the Islamic world, they smoke like fiends. Little children over there in Egypt, in, in Syria where we were, in Libya where we were, little children smoking cigarettes. And you can look in their face and see they've aged. Their eyes reflected the poison of the weed is killing them. Who are the merchants of the big tobacco companies? I don't say that it's just Jews, but they're involved heavily. They're involved in the pornography. They're involved in Hollywood filth. They're involved in the record industry. Did you see Patti LaBelle the other night? Now, Patti LaBelle is the singingest woman al al alive today. Patti LaBelle don't have to show her breasts with the Talent that that woman got, she don't have to slip her dress almost up to her damn crotch to step through. I didn't want to see Patti LaBelle's crotch. I wanted to hear the woman sing. I didn't want to see her breast. I ain't no damn baby. I left the breast a long time ago. Why she got to undress her breast for me and for you and for your children who make them like this? Now tell me I'm crazy. Who made Tina Turner like that? Where that filthy Mick Jagger could just pull off her clothes on universal television showing you that the black woman is a whore and any man can get you because a white man could step up to one of your black stars and undress her in front of the whole world and you ain't open your damn mouth because you're dead. Yes, sir. Rap artists coming out on the stage in a doggone diaper <laughs> pulling their private parts out on stage and people sitting there with their wives and they don't drag that nigga down and break his neck. You know why? Because you become pigs. Human pigs who love filth and hate cleanliness. Look at you. Anybody tell a dirty joke? You listen all night, but you're tired now. The minister, he's been going long enough. <laughs> I didn't mean to get off like this, brothers and sisters. I'm just going to complete this portion. I'm going to complete this portion. And, then, and I'll, I'll put a pin in this subject for next week. Look, beloved, look. You see, when God starts forming a person for his glory, it is a marvelous thing to see to understand what is going on. He takes a person and he chooses them. And he don't choose them because they're smart. He chooses them because they got the right kind of heart for his service. The scripture says, God tries the reins of the hearts. He can search <clears throat> the innards of a person. And he knows best where to place his message. I can look at the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And when he was taught by Master Farad Muhammad, and Master Farad Muhammad left him three and a half years into the mission and went away, he left Elijah Muhammad with guidance 
but he left him room in that guidance so he wouldn't become robotic. He allowed him to go over here and stub his toe, and go over here and stub his toe. And through trial and error, he discerned the correctness of the guidance. He's forming a person. He forms him with truth, and he forms him just like you do iron. When you chip it away from the rock, you got to take it and put it in fire. When you put it in fire and separate it, it forms a hard mass of fire. Fire now. Back to fire. Then you take that fire and you take your hammer and you beat it into the shape that you want it. When you beat it into the shape that you want it, you cool it with water. And you have a fine metal instrument. When God wants to forge an instrument, as Isaiah the prophet said, I will make for you a new sharp threshing instrument having teeth. When it bites you, you bit. But if he's going to make it, he's got to blow on it. He's got to put it on the anvil and beat it. He's got to put it in fire and burn it and then form it. So he said he formed man from the dust of the earth. It's marvelous. The Quran says he fashioned him and made him complete. Fashioned, shaped him. And the, the way God shapes you for his service is with trial and tribulation that's like beating you. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm saying this, that when God, when you want to become a God, you have to submit to God. When you, when you don't know God, he has to reveal himself. When he reveals himself to you and you are sure that he is who he is, you submit. When you submit to him, that's the first act that you must perform in order for him to make you. You must submit. Now you're fire, but if you submit to God, he will give you that which will enable you to control every aspect of your passion so that you become a whole person. But while you are forming, it's a steady trial and tribulation and beating and pounding to get you into the shape that he is ready for you now to put you before the world. I'm saying that to say this. And I don't want you to think that Farrakhan is dealing in vanity or self-conceit. But I was a good child. I loved you from a tender age. I was in love with black people. I had a marvelous black mother. The color of this sister sitting right here, real dark and beautiful. Not very highly educated, but very wise. And that woman, with a stern discipline, yes, and her love for me in a way that I never knew she loved me till I was grown. Because she showed me love in a way that I could not readily understand it. We understand love by the tender embrace. I love you, baby. But she showed me love in a different way. She broke my neck when I did the wrong thing. And there were three lessons that I learned growing up that I shall never forget. When I was a young boy, 13, my mother bought me a new suit for Easter. And I was out in Fenway Park in Roxbury showing off with the boys and a little white boy was there fishing in a creek and he pulled his pole up out of the creek and when he snapped it a little of the water from the creek fell on my new suit <laughs> that white boy didn't do anything to me 
I had a little metal bracelet and I took it off and put it over my hand. And I walked up to the white boy and said, look, man, you dirtied my clothes, you know. <laughs> and I hit him with that metal bracelet. And to this day, I remember that because it was an unjust action on my part. Even though he's the children of those who enslaved my fathers, he had done nothing personally to me. And I had no right for vanity's sake. Wasn't a justified reason, but to show off to my boys, which I may never have done it if I was alone. I struck him. I don't know whether I broke his jaw. But it bothered me long after that it bothered me. And so inwardly I know that there is a justice that God put in me along with my love of black people 